Where is everyone that's cutting the panel? We got Heath. Where's Heath at? He's in the back. All right, he's coming. Adam, thank you. Yeah, it's perfect. We're going to pass this mic. Yeah. Oh, I did see the big book. What's up? Oh, you know, another day. Ty Cobb. Pretty as well. This is amazing. Yeah, it's pretty all right, we're good. I'm going to have you guys start with the introductions. Um, your name, your company, what you guys do in less than 30 seconds. Let's do it. What do I do? What does that mean? <laughs> like for hobbies, like personal life, or just like... Just go for it, bro. Travis, uh, President and CEO of, uh, of Rufo. Adam Sand from, Adam Sand from RV Consulting. Uh, we help a lot of users of technology. Clay Weingart, Ugly Roof. You know who we are, Roofing Nation. He takes with Absolute Roofing and the Catch-All. Oh, and Roof Warrior. <laughs> uh, my name is Jake Pass. I do consulting across the country for roofing companies and solar companies. I am the founder and owner of SolarCon and Solar Academy. And I am Ty Backer, owner and founder of Casey Backer Construction. Awesome. So we're going to be talking about the future of roofing technology. We're going to be talking about roll-ups in the industry, what you can do to compete, things like that, how to get acquired, etc. But I also want to get your guys' current problems and what you want to hear from these folks. So I'm actually, what, are, what is a major issue or something that you really are looking for more info on right now in your business? Is there anyone bold enough to give me a little snippet of what they're working on? Yes. Um, Love that. What else? Yes, sir. Coatings. Roof coatings. Okay. What else? Uh, basically, what are you working on in your business right now or a problem in your business? from these guys. Yes? So, uh, like sustainable growth, how to how fast do you want to grow before it gets too risky? Ooh, I like that one. One more? Anybody? Alright, let's get into it. Alright, bye. Let's start with one of these. Let's start with the growing too fast one. That, that one sounds fun. What's too fast? I'm, I'm going, I've, I've done this like six times before, but I want to uh, put this a little bit more on what these guys are asking. We obviously have the roll-up question and the technology question, but I want to talk a little bit about what people are most interested in. So, what's too fast? How do you know you're growing too, or at the right pace? So, uh, for context, um, we're seven years in at Abaco Roofing, and we went, we had five million our first year, 10 million, 20 million, 25 million, 31 million. It was way too fast. Um, there were years we didn't make money. There were years where everything broke and people left. And it was a miserable experience, although there's lots of success on the outside. Everybody looking at you saying how awesome it is. And, you know, we won awards and all that kind of stuff. But um, it was definitely too fast. If, if you want to rate it in percentages, personally, looking back, I'd say 20% is probably as much as you want to try to grow in a year. And 10% while maintaining your increasing profitability is a much more reasonable goal. Now, if you're small in the range of like zero to three million or something, you can maybe jump up a little bit without exploding everything. But um, once you start to get above like five million, it just needs to be really controlled growth. I'd say above three million, you have a plan to control it, and make sure that as you grow, it's profitable, and you don't have to increase your overhead uh, significantly in order to grow, because that's where it really bites people. That's the problem with massive growth and such cultural problems is you can't sustain your overhead once you dip down from the pace you thought you were having or maybe you had for six months or 12 months and then it dips for a natural reason because your people leave, your sales people leave or the market kicks back because you got a bunch of bad reviews or whatever and you dip down your overhead just eat your lunch super fast. So if you can if you can grow without increasing overhead, it's, it's a safer bet. 
but you're gonna probably gonna have to grow some, but I would say 10, 20% of these needs to be pulled and uh, controlled, and you need to have a plan on paper to know that you're maintaining or increasing profitability while you're doing that. I'd like to hear Ty and Adam on this, so. Um, so I love your answer, but there's a part of me that almost wholeheartedly disagrees for one reason, your success. He grew too fast, as he would say, he, but sir, there were some years where he didn't make as much profit or didn't make as much. Sorry, we're just taking this. Oh. Excuse me. Okay. Anyways, so uh, there's some years where he didn't make money, so it really comes down to the leader and what you can handle. You have to be able to answer that question for yourself. Um, because you know, there's a company in San Antonio that did 50 million their very first year, right? There's other companies that have been open for 15 years and are still under a million. It really comes down to you as a leader and understanding how much pain tolerance you're willing to have. So really knowing your numbers and being able to manage it, I would say that you know, in spite of you saying that, you have Avco, Catchall, the other thing you said, um, you're speaking, you're teaching, you're a coach, you're a leader. So he's a success by every measure of a roofing company owner. He's successful. And so you have to know what your pain tolerance is and what your risk tolerance is. And it's going to come down to having the right people. Um, I would say that the best statistic for understanding what direction you're trending in is to calculate your revenue per capita. So roofing companies tend to, I mean, they're all, they're all the same. It's like if you're at 350,000 revenue per capita, so I guess wisdom begins the definition of terms. Revenue per capita is your revenue divided by the number of people that work at your company that don't put nails through shingles, right? So if you're a $1 million company, one person is 1 million revenue per capita. If you're a $5 million company with owner, like uh, accountant and three salespeople, you're a million dollars revenue per capita. So um, if you're at like 350,000, you probably are throwing people at problems. So. One person farts, everybody wears rubber pants, now you need a guy to run the rubber pants division, you need someone else to be a procurement officer for the rubber pants, and then there needs to be a person who's doing the safety around the rubber pants, you know what I mean? So you're throwing people at problems because you don't have systems, processes, or any kind of technology leverage. Um, then there's companies at the other end, where about a million, that's where people are doing three jobs, you know what I mean? So that's where the owner is a salesperson, is a production manager, is everything, and that's where the error rate starts to go up, and you start running the risk of Google reviews, and then and the, you know, profitability issues, right? Um, five to seven hundred thousand is generally a good run rate to be at, unless you have some like really kick-ass stuff in, in the form of like systems, processes, technology, and create leverage, um, or like really high dollar value can like federal contracting jobs. But like let's just assume we're all like retail roofers, right? Um, then like a million is where you start to get in trouble. Three hundred fifty thousand get into trouble. Five to seven hundred thousand is good, and just knowing how to make decisions when you're at the five to seven hundred thousand dollar range to know which direction you're going in. That would be my best advice, but knowing your own pain tolerance and your own skill sets, and just building your character traits, your skills, and your beliefs in yourself as you go. On your revenue per capita, are you trying to first make sales people, or is that just sales? Yeah, the sales people. How long did it take you to figure out these numbers? Five years. Five years? Yeah. To say, okay, this is where we want to be at. Right. Yeah, it's not for me as a roofing company, it's for me as a consultant working in a lot of companies. You know, I, I think this is a really good uh, you know, question because, uh, especially during a downturn right now, most people are thinking about how they can scale back and not necessarily grow or grow too fast. But honestly, this is the time to grow. There are so many opportunities right now that's out there right now. You just got to kind of keep your head on a swivel. But for me, early on, um, years ago, there wasn't things like this, right? There wasn't CRMs there. Shit, I don't even think Google had a calendar yet. Um, it was just strictly a day planner. And one of the rules of thumb early on in business that I followed was is grow as fast as the cash will allow us to grow, right? We, we weren't leveraging the banks. I, I didn't have lines of credit, thank God. Um, today, like our building is paid for, we paid cash. I just saved money. I busted my ass, we put money back, but, and we like created our own lines of credit. Like, so each job we put a certain percentage back that we could pull from when we needed to. Like during the winter months to keep our bills caught up and stuff like that, um, that was probably one of the biggest things. Um, these guys talk more in, in like terms of like scientific, but but for me, I'm more of a layman's terms kind of guy, um, so I can't speak on the per capita stuff like that. But the biggest thing was is he talked. He, uh, Adam talked about the the threshold of pain. You know, 
really that's what it comes down to the, like how much pain can you tolerate right will will help expedite the the growth that you have because i mean for me and most business owners our threshold for pain isn't the same as an employee would be right nobody's going to take care of your business like you're going to and one of the biggest things was is that i led by example i was the first one there and the last one to leave and then today, now today like i'm like the fifth one there like i will not get up any earlier than these guys are getting there like i'm just not going to get up at 2 30 anymore and like to beat them there um so we just we set the pace we set the tempo in the beginning and i surrounded myself around smarter people than i was in certain areas that i wasn't so smart and like i would hire adam to probably do my books i i have no business doing my books now have I had people, um, am I smart enough to count money and no fractions and things like that? Of course, that's why we're still in business 15 years later. But I knew if I wanted to grow, because I was the bottleneck, right? Like I was holding us back from growth. Like I needed to start hiring people, again, that were smarter than me in certain areas that I didn't have time. Like why should I figure out how to create a website? Why would I waste my time on those things when I need to go out and make sure there's enough work coming in to feed that pipeline to keep everybody busy? Make sense? All right, I'm gonna get to one of the other questions. Oh, I got a mic. Um, but I'll, I'll see who we'll pass to. Um, we are talking about developing leaders. Somebody had a great question around that. Um, how are you developing leaders and how have you seen um, roofing company owners develop leaders in their business in a way that um, scales? I'll go with a few first here. Sure. Yeah, developing leaders is, is tricky just because you want to find that balance between over-educating and having them leave your organization and go and build their own, right? Or um, keeping them in your organization, it, it becomes tricky. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go back and say systems and processes will help with that. The contracts that you generate will help with that. You can create a world or an atmosphere uh, that your people can live and operate in. And once they hit these boundaries, then, then you know they don't leave. What you do is you, you create these, these boundaries within your organization that they can operate in, and, um, and maybe even your own language uh, so that they can't speak with other roofer, uh, roofing contractors. You want to create an environment that they feel like they can grow in, right? And if you can create growth and boundaries, like a level of growth and you can create boundaries, then you can edify someone and give them a lot of responsibility and build them up to other people in your organization, but you have to define what that is first. You have to define what the pattern of growth is for them, the way they're going to succeed in your company, and if they have that, and and you and you edify them to the to the people around you, then you have created a leader, right? You've created somebody that can grow inside of your business and that can push boundaries. But the most important thing uh, that you do in this situation is you make them earn it. You don't just hand it to them and say, hey, I really like you, I think you're capable, uh, take this position. You put them in with everybody else and the highest end ones will rise to every uh, metric that you want them to perform at within your organization. And you'd be surprised. The people you'd actually probably put there initially end up trailing off. Jake Bennington said it best. He said, you know, if, if you're just consistent, you end up being successful, right? And so, You'll be surprised, the most successful, the, mo the most silver-tongued person that you have in that organization, the one that you think you can really edify, ends up being the one that's less consistent, and then you've built, uh, you've built this position on somebody that is flaky, or that's gonna let you down at some point, and then you can't grow your organization, but yeah, that's pretty much it. I got a heat on this one. Oh, I feel like I answered the last one. <laughs> uh, I think to build a leader, you gotta let them lead, so, um, Give them responsibility that's clear. So this is what's expected of you. This is your lane. Jen's been using that, this is your lane. But then don't just say, oh no, they're, you're starting to make a mistake and snatch it back. So to really create a leader, you have to let them think things through. You have to let them make some mistakes on their own and learn from that. And then just having the guidelines clear, because when you have people who are motivated and they like to take ownership, sometimes they may do something crazy that you didn't want them to do start taking ownership. So just make the boundaries clear. These are the expectations. This is what you're allowed to do. And then simply allow them to leave instead of snatching everything back the second that something goes wrong. Adam? I just want to hear his answer. 
Actually, the amazing thing within this industry is that years ago, we didn't have people to go to for things like this. Within our industry now, we have so many consultants out there that do anything from sales to leadership to processes, to everything that you can go to to actually improve your business, which is something fairly new within the last five years where we have gotten all of these people to be able to come in and be professionals in an area to where they can help you within your business. So there are people you can consult to say, hey, I want to grow leaders, I want to grow culture, I want to make champions within my organization. You, you, you can go to people that they can, you can bring them into your organization to work and they can help you with these things. One of the biggest things is, is, is that a lot of companies hate to overtrain people or essentially give them too much knowledge because they're afraid they're going to go start their own company. But if you have a great culture and they have room for growth within your organization, they can see that clear path to where they can grow, they're never going to leave your organization because they love where they're at. So one of the things I like too is a lot of companies, they have some of their people actually rate or score some of like their people to get actually promoted within. So essentially like if like once a year, once a quarter, whatever it may be, they go around and actually score people. And sometimes they promote their leaders based on how the other employees actually score them as well. So that and delegation. As a business owner, you have to be able to yourself be able to delegate to other people and then also have your people learn to actually delegate so that then they can manage you know, other people as well. All right, I'm going to go to some of our questions that we've had some of the other panels as well. I would like to talk about what we think is going to happen in Rufin in the next three, five, ten years, and feel free to choose the time frame that you feel like you have some insight on or, or some guesses. What do you think is going to happen? Um, and let's just go straight down the line on this one. Um, what do you think is going to happen in the next three to five years in Rufin? And yeah, that's it. I think this is the most exciting times to be in the roofing industry with everything that's going on from you know roll-ups, everybody's heard of those as far as creating these mass companies, these huge organizations, to the technology that's now coming into this industry. Um, there's a lot of exciting things that, that are going to happen. It's going to be very, very interesting over the next three to five years. Um, even from, we're seeing companies now start to bring in essentially in-house sales reps, where essentially they're just selling things in-house and paying commissions you know, as low as 3%. I think what's the average now, 10% commissions or whatever it may be. Um, but as far as technology, I mean, the way that we see it, manufacturers and suppliers essentially want essentially 25 to 30% by 2025 to be, uh, be online. Whether that's the consumer buying online or them ordering their materials online or whatever it may be. But essentially, manufacturers and suppliers have that goal that they have set out as far as where they see the future being. But me, myself, personally, I think it depends as far as everybody in this room, right? The roofing contractors or the, the, uh, everybody that actually adopts these processes or puts these things in place in their business is actually going to show kind of where this goes. But me, myself, as far as what we do, I, I can see it being probably between 30 to 40 percent in the next five years, some way, shape, or form where they're purchasing or making some sort of commitment actually online without somebody actually knowing. And I want to know, I'm looking for some bold predictions here. Be a little risky on this if you've got some ideas, because I just want to, I know it's, sometimes it's easy to stay safe, um, but yeah. You, Tim says that because he knows what I'm going to say. Um, and it's because every time this question comes up, I say the same thing and I usually lose the room because I say that 80% of roofing companies don't deserve to exist. And that means that basically if you just draw a line down the row, basically that row, are the only ones. And um, that's a scary thing to say, but I kind of evolved my thinking to be a little more room friendly, which is 80% of roofing business owners aren't prepared to exist currently. And it's because there's, the, 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 cha the industry is changing. This is a timeless vertical, and most of the value arbitrage that roofing owners bring to the table is the ability to herd the cats of like the roofers, right? It's just, it's so big to run an organization of say, thousand roofers that it hasn't been really consolidated yet because that was really tough. It's not like a Walmart where you have a 40,000 square foot store and cameras everywhere and you can watch people's every move. You're running a store that's 100 miles square and you have no way to do field service management. But technology is coming in for um, all these solutions. And in a business, you really only have four points of leverage for massive growth. I didn't come up with this. This is Naval Ravikant, but he says like four seats. You have Capital, the ability to deploy money, right, to create leverage, right? Collaboration, so people, right, the ability to have to use labor of many people. 
content, right, the ability to attract attention at scale, and code, right, the ability to duplicate effort at scale. And those four things, roofers are typically not investing in at least three of them, right? At best, they're just working on collaboration. They don't have a ton of capital. You can spend three grand to start a roofing company. If you want to open a frozen yogurt shop, you're going to have to spend $100,000 on lease improvements, $20,000 on point of sale, buy inventory, train staff, get a sign, all that, and the first customer walks in with $7 to buy a Froyo, right? Roofing company, you get a $3,000 credit card and a car and a ladder, and you can sell your first roof for $10,000, put the material in your credit card, give the work to a sub, get paid 10 grand, you got three grand profit in your pocket, Boom, you're a roofing company. You stole your contract from your boss, change the logo in the top left corner, like, and you're basically off the races. So we're spoiled in this industry. And I spoiled, being spoiled has made, made the industry um, leadership overall weak, right? There's not a lot of business acumen out there. And so as the smart money comes in and you see a lot of investment, you hear like, you know, don't want to people answer questions about roll ups. And it's like, well, what are people paying? They say a 3.5 times the bid or something, a three and a half years of profit. So the smartest money is really saying that we think that we can gobble up market share and in about three and a half years, we can choke everybody out and there will be like significantly less roofing companies. And so if what I see happening in about three and a half years is a lot of us are not gonna exist and a lot of people need to be very self-aware and understand where they either need to go to work, put your head down, and start swinging haymakers and work your ass off to survive and you will be, you know, you'll reach the promised land and then some percentage of us in the roofing industry have to look and say, maybe I should get a job. Maybe I would be a very valuable teammate for my particular skill set for a leader who has the ability to deploy all points of leverage. So, I mean, take that as you will. You can hate me if you want, but I, that would be my prediction. Whether I'm right or wrong, we'll figure it out. Yeah, I tend to agree with some of what Adam's saying, what Jen's saying, we had Steve Badger in here the other day. Um, the writing's kind of on the wall with the way the insurance industry's going. Um, and as things go, basically the country will become Florida, gradually, which is a very, very difficult insurance market and it's gonna get tougher. So what I see is there will be a shift toward retail. Uh, when that happens, inevitably, people who don't have a sales organization, there will be a race to the bottom to try to get deals signed. Uh, margins will go down, and then you'll have a lot of roofers that just go out of business. Um, and I think what you'll be left with once that happens in every given market is sales organizations. You'll be left with companies who are like uh, big HVAC companies or window companies, in-home sales organizations, because those are the people who understand how to work the retail model. So I think the, the big thing to do to prepare yourself for that is create systems and processes based around sales so that you're ready for your market to become extremely difficult with the insurance and you can ultimately move to retail. Um, going maybe like 10 years down the road, we're noticing environmental changes, right? There's a whole green movement, people are buying Teslas, and we see that with shingle manufacturers who have to meet ESG platforms and standards. And I think what we'll see is there will be a change, a shift away from asphalt shingles and onto other materials that are more environmentally friendly. <coughs> I think we'll also see maintenance items. Somebody mentioned coatings, uh, products like roof rejuvenation, where we can extend the life of a roof instead of just bringing shingles into landfills. Uh, there will be new products that satisfy ultimately where we're heading environmentally. So um, it's good to look at other things. Also, if you're a company owner, what else is out there that's not just asphalt shingles? Because if you plan on being in business for a long time, if you're selling new and innovative products, you'll put yourself in a good position as our market begins to shift. Uh, I would echo a little bit of what Adam was saying over here. I think in the five year range, uh, a lot of the small companies that sit in this room or go to the conferences that we go to are gonna have a very difficult time differentiating themselves or overcoming the large players in the market. Um, I think in order to survive that, you're gonna have to become sharp, you're gonna have to become smart, you know, to pivot and grow and be able to differentiate yourself from them. It's, it's not always dangerous when there's a really large player in the market because it's easy for you to adapt and change around them a lot faster than they can adapt and change. Um, you know, in, in whatever's going to be the first, you know, billion dollar roofing company, um, three years into their existence when they decide to change their sales process, they're going to bring in a guy like Adam to do some tech stuff. And, you know, different guys in this room, it's going to take them two years to get that implemented into the field. You can change in two weeks. So 
you absolutely can't survive. You just have to understand now that you're going to have to be really smart and willing to change and grow and learn new things at all the time if you want to continue to exist um, beyond that, that kind of inflection point of consolidation that's going to happen where anybody that's notable and profitable is probably going to get rolled up or merged or bought or um, some version of that and it's going to leave the you know one to twenty million dollar players trying to figure out how to compete with these people that come in with giant ad budgets and armies of door knockers or online lead generators that you just there's no way you can compete with uh, things like that you're just going to have to pivot i don't think it's the death knell for everybody but for somebody who just wants to kind of like get up and have a couple of people around that they're hanging around with and make some beer money and maybe score a little for, for money for retirement if that's your goals and that's the way you approach business you're probably not going to make it through that season Timothy wanted both. Um, I think everyone should work on roofs naked. I don't. <laughs> um, no, so I, I do agree with everything these guys are saying. Consolidation is coming. Uh, roll ups are going to be a really big thing. If you guys don't know what roll ups are, uh, let's say your company it could sell for $5 million on whatever multiple they decide on. If you go in with a larger company, that $5 million turns into $10 million uh, automatically the moment you join them. Uh, the complications with that is integrating CRMs, pay skills, um, processes, systems, everything that you built. You got to merge it with another company. If you get chaotic, you can have a fallout. But uh, rollups are going to be big. I do think horizontal integration is going to be a big thing. Um, I, I think a lot of roofers and a lot of them are already doing it now. Probably your more successful ones are doing more than just roofing. Uh, they've started to carry other products and start to build that in their organizations. Um, and I think. I think, I think you guys are all right. Uh, Roll-ups, horizontal integration, and consolidation, it's all coming. Yeah, I mean, uh, I've heard a lot of good things, and, and I really think the next 12 months, um, there's going to be some significant changes. Um, during any time there, that there's a recession, I, there's what I call a transfer of wealth, right? So a lot of those weaker companies probably won't be here in 12 months. Um, a lot of stronger companies will be able to uh, capitalize on those who have fallen. Uh, they'll be able to gain more market share. Um, those who have been around for a while and have seen recessions uh, know that there's a lot of opportunities. Um, so I think in the next 12 months, there's gonna be a lot of changes happening to our industry. Um, I think. There's going to be a lot of guys that go out of business. I think there's going to be a lot of guys that grow. The next three to five years, I think we do see a lot of uh, roll-ups, mergers, things like that. Does that mean that the local hometown contractor is going to go out of business? I don't think so. I think there's going to be plenty of small towns where, where there's a lot of local people who want to go with that local contractor, right? Um, we were having a discussion last night, and you don't hear a lot about this, but until you get to a certain level, I feel like you could almost over market yourself. I think a lot of times people are going to start looking at bigger contractors and realize, you know, they're too expensive. We want to go with a guy that, that has less overhead that won't be as expensive. And a lot of people like to go with local things, right? Because I know when Angie started, you know, the, the rumors of Angie becoming a roofing business, I think a lot of people started to get freaked out. But I mean, I haven't seen them in our neighborhood yet. Um, I don't know where they're at or I don't know what their reach is going to be. So I think I think we're being a little premature on getting all freaked out and panicked. I think the biggest thing that we need to project on, and believe me, I'm a visionary. I'm always constantly thinking, you know, three months, six months, six years from now. But I think what we really need to focus on is trying to get through the next 12 months. What are we going to do to stay relevant for the next 12 months, right? Are we getting in solar? Somebody mentioned about going green. If you haven't gotten in the solar, um, I think I think it's wise that you would. Roof rejuvenation, repairs. If you don't have a service department within your regime, you should probably start looking into that. Do not turn down repairs or rejuvenation. There's a lot of money there. A lot of contractors don't do repairs. I don't know how many phone calls we get on a daily basis where a homeowner calls in and they state, like I've, I've talked to three roofing contractors already today, they're not interested in repairs. We are. We have several trucks on the road. The guys do nothing but roof repairs all day long. We're getting ready to become a, a vendor for Ugly Roof. I think that's a that's a great way because let's face it, we're in an economic downturn right now. People aren't gonna wanna spend $18,000 on a roof, but will they spend $5,000 on a repair and rejuvenation to give them five more years? Hell yes. I mean, I would. 
right? And for those sales guys that, um, so for me, I have sales guys that have no problem selling $120,000 uh, solar roof, right? But I got other salespeople that just can't look a homeowner in the eyes. And, and because I love them, I don't get rid of them because they're not a $2 million producer, but they sell the hell out of repairs, right? So I'm really looking forward to selling roof rejuvenations because I know one in particular sales rep that I have will crush it in that because he knows he's offering a service to a homeowner that's an affordable service, plus we can give them a repair with a five-year warranty. Um, I just feel like that's the way to go. Roof rejuvenation and solar will definitely help keep you relevant for the next three to five years. I just wanted to add something to that. Uh, we have solar sales reps now across the country that are starting to go sell roof rejuvenations and get those and get that business. We'll just call a roofer and say, hey, we go and do that and we'll go sell the solar because roof regen, roof regen uh, rejuvenation, sorry, is just a lead generation tool. And yeah, the money going into those things is not that much. It's not bringing a lot of revenue in. But talk about one of your greatest uh, entries to lead generation. Here, I got it. Oh, yeah. So, and also the one thing I was talking about, the roof rejuvenation, who do you think they're gonna call in three to five years when they do need that roof replaced. I call it compounding interest, right? Especially with the repairs. Let's say it's a $150 repair, but in three months, it's gonna be that $15,000 roof, plus that compounding interest of those three referrals you're gonna receive from that $150 roof repair. So make sure you get into repairs. Yeah, I'm gonna kind of just um, tackle, drill more into the roll-ups thing. So before uh, we move on with that. So you guys are kind of touching on it a little bit. I want you guys to go and we can go in whatever order here, but I want to talk about either competing with the roll-ups, how you would do that if you're seeing that start to enter your market in the next few years, um, and, and or how you would get position yourself to be acquired by one of those. And feel free to talk about either one, but those are the two subjects. Go for it. Yeah, I just worked in a company for a year uh, that is a roll-up. Lumio, right across the street over here, uh, 6,000 sales reps, and spending a lot of money. And uh, I was at the forefront of merging those companies and their systems and processes. It is complicated. Um, it is easy to compete against. Uh, they have to usually have higher price stuff than, than most organizations do uh, because of all the overhead that they've incurred, the covenants they've made with banks in order to acquire these, these companies. Um, someone mentioned large sales forces that they're typically going to have a larger sales force. Their, their rate to market, the, the amount they're selling homeowners to market is gonna be higher than what your guys' will be. That's, that's a given. Um, now, the, the sheer volume of people going out into your markets and knocking on doors or, or contacting homeowners, that's what you're gonna compete against. If you guys have a really clear, clean way of doing that, then I think you can, I think you can compete in, in the place. If you do wanna be part of a, a roll-up, uh, a lot of what Jen Silver teaches is going to help you with that. Accrual based accounting is going to be one of the first things that they look at. Um, what was your name right here? The last Adam. Adam. A lot of what Adam said a little bit earlier uh, with those, with those, was it four, the four C's? Yeah. Uh, they're going to look for those. What business can they plug into? Are you a business that they're going to plug into? So if it's a bicycle wheel, are you, are you down here in the center? Are you one of the spokes of the businesses that's going to plug into those things that you have? The customer, the way the customer acquisition, uh, plugging into a specific CRM, right? They're gonna look at these things and they're gonna determine which one are you and that's that's your value into the organization. If the company's gonna buy you to be that central hub, you're gonna get more. If you're gonna be one of those little spokes that, that attaches to this, you're gonna get a little bit less. But some things that I have seen, it's kind of a segue between the roll-up and running your own company, is you can go to these larger companies knowing that they wanna sell and you can say, hey, if we bring our volume under you, we put our shirts on, uh, can we get a percentage of that exit without being part owner or part founder of this thing? And uh, for those of you that are afraid that you might not be able to pull this stuff off, that is another way to do this. And we're starting to see that on the solar side as well. Anyone? Yeah, go like it. Uh, so the question was how to compete or prepare? Yes. Um, I would say on the competition side, uh, this is a little bit of my personal ethos, uh, I'm going to be faster and more direct. Um, so we, uh, our main lead generation tool at our company is, is knocking doors. And the reason we do that is because we, can, we get there first. We create customers that don't know their customers yet. And um, 
you know, those companies are going to come into town, they're going to kind of like sneak in, they're going to find someone to purchase, they're going to do a bunch of research, they're going to start a bunch of online campaigns, and they're going to try to find customers that need roofs, and I'm finding customers that don't even know they need roofs, and showing them why they need one. And so that's how I compete, um, or, or will compete, um, on the positioning to um, get the higher side. I was actually, our company was actually in the world for a year and a half. Um, I was really smart in my uh, contracts in the beginning that I made the contract so I could back out at any time, get the stock back and move out, no harm, no foul, just unwind the agreement. And very thankful that I did that. Um, it did not go great. Um, but while I was in it, I was involved in a lot of what he was talking about, trying to integrate the companies and, and get them to operate as one large company. And um, what they're going to look for very first thing is, are you profitable? Are you profitable enough for them to even consider any level of deep dive? And they're going to want 12% plus probably on your net, maybe 10% if you're large and you have something, some good reason to explain why it's a little low this year or the last year or two. Um, but they're going to want you to be profitable and they're going to want you to look mature with real processes, real systems, talents and players on your team. They don't want to see just a slap together a group of really great sales guys that's out there swinging shields everywhere. That just seems like chaos to them. So it's better to be a team of five to eight salespeople that's producing five to $10 million that's profitable, that doesn't have a lot of problems, that doesn't have a lot of li liabilities out there. You'll be a lot more prime target than the $25 million guy down the street, which I have been in years past, that wasn't running smoothly and wasn't making money. Yeah, we generated more revenue, but we would have been really hard to, to fit into their system and it would, have been, it would have been chaos. They'd much rather find a five or $10 million target that's smooth and smart and, and operates efficiently. So. Yeah, I think as far as competing with roll-ups, don't let them clean your clock because you don't look professional. So it, it doesn't take a lot of money to be professional. It takes a lot of work to be professional. So they're going to go in there with a presentation. They're going to have a thorough inspection. They're going to be scripted. They're going to look like pros. All that just takes work to create those processes and implement them. So you can compete with them, and you'll compete with them at a better price because obviously you're more lean. So. Uh, and then to the other side, how to be acquired, uh, Keith hit on a good point at the last conference, and that is, you know, don't treat your business like don't rob your business. So you need your business to be profitable. Um, the other thing is you need your process to be replicatable. So if I do eight million a year and I've got one guy who did three or four million of that, you know, that's pretty scary if I'm an investor. I'm, I'm really banking on that one guy sticking with the company forever. So again, it goes back to my sales processes. I want all my reps, I want the production side to be consistent, and you need that in a program like Train Tool or something where every guy who comes in, I can now replicate that process. And then now you have a company. You have something that can be bought because it's not a one-off, it's a process, it's something that can happen consistently with any player that's brought into the organization. Um, everybody here had great answers, and I think that for the room, the best service I can do is not add anything to what they're saying, but try and summarize what I think the advice that they're trying to give, which is that you can't decide whether you're going to prepare to be bought or that you're going to compete with them. It's simply to compete, you must be prepared, and to prepare to be bought, you must be competitive. You have to be more expensive to compete with than to just acquire, right? So it ultimately comes down to creating enterprise value in your company that makes it so that you're an acquisition target because it's just easier to use what they find to be easy to get and ubiquitous, which is capital, right? And they're just like, well, let's just write another check because they have the power to just write money. So they would just do that because you're more expensive to compete with. So you have to take all this advice and just improve the unit economics of your business, make it a duplicatable system, right? Find ways to, to you know, gobble up market share to make sure that your brand is something that's just easier to move off the table or to get, right? So either they get your brand, secure it, wait till they finally build their system and then you know change your name, or they just get you and take your name and take you off, take your Google reviews off the off the <coughs> playing field. So you don't know whether you're gonna get bought or whether you're gonna be one of the next hundred million dollar companies in this region. So simply just prepare by competing and compete by being prepared. Want more on, 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 edit on this? You know what? I would like to switch it actually. Uh, if you're cool with that, I would like to switch it to tools and things that you think people should be layering on. So people touched on the roof. We talked about different materials, different tools, but I want to dive in a little bit more to that. And I want you to not even mention your tool if you are representing a tool. 
Um, I would like us, anything you think um, that would be a couple tools or materials to look at. I would love you guys to share things that you think are actually um, important for roofers to look at right now. Uh, physical tools or like technology? Technology or physical tools. And I'm asking you guys to avoid your own just for, I, I feel like that would get it. Yes, redundant. Um, as far as technology, uh, integrations are a big one, and we kind of go back to you know a company being able to grow. So I know that for a fact, Alpha Construction did ten ten million dollars additional this last year without adding a single person. All through being able to look at their technology that they had in place and say, we have four different pieces of technology or tools that we use that we are not using every piece of them. They're not even linked together or however that looks. So able to take all these things and it drives me nuts to see that people use maybe two different types of CRMs or even these other tools that don't really link each other and then you're manually adding people to take information to move it to another one. So look at all of the pieces of technology that you have within your organization to say, how can we be better? How can we be utilizing every piece of the technology that we're paying for? Because I bet there's so much technology out there that essentially you're, you're not using all the pieces of it. The next piece of it is, is that the biggest thing I talk about a lot in that we look at it, it, is everyone wants to blame manufacturers and suppliers for how crazy the prices have gotten for, for shingles or per square or whatever we're charging. We need to look at ourselves as roofing companies to actually look and see as far as why the price is so high. So if we look as far as number one, starting with marketing, if we can get the same amount of leads for $500,000 and a million dollars, what we've seen, people are just throwing money at Google, at COS, yeah, they're, just, they're throwing money at ANG for all these contacts, and they can really look at it and say, how can we optimize within our organization to maybe get some sort of lead conversions on our website, or wherever it may be as far as getting better within yourself as far as your marketing, because I think that if we really look at our, how we're spending it, we can definitely make ourselves more efficient to where we can actually generate more leads, more contacts, more appointments for, for less money. Um, I think that to preface anything about what technology you should get, I can't make a decision for you that might be better for you and vice versa. Um, if you're looking at bringing technology into your business, you really want to start with your people and your customer. Don't solve for yourself. You, we know what you want. You want to make more money, more profit, have less stress, less error rate. So solve for your people. Find out what's keeping them up at night. Find out the things that are causing error rates between departments, right? Break down the silos of like sales and production and marketing and accounting and find out where they're setting each other up for failure. And then once you understand the people part of your problem, then start to focus on the actual process. Because in business, you either have a people problem or a process problem. Usually it's a mixture of both. So find out what problems your people have and then figure out where that translates into your process. And then just try and look at it through the lens of how do I scale human effort in the business um, and make it so that things are transitioned from each stage of the buyer's journey more smoothly and then solve for that and then go looking for that technology solution um, because every business is at a different place. Every single company has a different mix of human talent and so I think that that's how you, you approach the problem of finding the technology and then of course there's vendors out the ass that will sell to you. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to, because you always mention Arrivee as one of the things you like. I just, I also want us to drop some random like okay. tools in here too. I wanted to spring like some actual tech, tools. Yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you guys, guys what. So if your problem is, like I said, the problem with the shopping mall, you, do, you have the 100 mile square shopping mall, field service management, I think, is a way to scale human effort. Um, knowing where your people are, knowing what they're doing, at what stage they are, and then connecting that customer experience through that. So just trying to make more of like an Uber of roofing. And so there's a tool out there called Arrivee that essentially allows you to do that. You can give your reps a phone, you can schedule, dispatch them, know where they are on the map. The customer is getting the like, the I'm on my way, time to meet your inspector at the door. Your roofers have ripped the roof, you know, stay inside until we're done. Like, giving the customer the Uber-like experience while also getting field service management and being able to better dispatch and plan their routes will improve those uh, improve those unit economics of, of per person, right? So, all right, there's one. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, one that we use a lot is it's a program called Engage. They make really nice presentations. Um, but what's cool about Engage, and there's others out there, is there's analytics behind it. So like I look at things from a sales management perspective. Uh, I have a rep in the field who tells me they're using the presentation every time. I go on to analytics and see they have an open data month. So analytics allows you to kind of call crap 
uh, on your sales system, which is important. Um, the other one is that I see underutilized is who here has company cam. Okay, and then who here shoots a video on every inspection in company cam? So that's a trend that I've noticed. Uh, people love videos, so shoot a one minute video on the roof of all the problems you found. You know, utilize that tool since you already have it. And then maybe the third one to utilize if you don't have it already is, is pick up a financing option. Get with somebody because that's how people buy retail things. I don't have the bread right now for a new roof. I would have to go down a financing route. And then when you pitch it in the home, as roofers, I see a lot of people like, oh, I gave them a zero percent option. That's an expensive payment if you're going 12 months or 18 on, you know. So pitch it just like Ford does. If I'm gonna buy a new F-150, they're gonna give me a cash price and the longest payment option they can show me because it looks less expensive. You know, so make sure that if you have a tool like say a financing option that you're actually utilizing it the way that other big companies are. So those are three tools that I've enjoyed. Uh, I'll just give you a, a brief description of our tech stack at Avico. Um, I would say the backbone of everything is gonna be which CRM you choose. Is there, who, all, who in here is all, is all, has a CRM that operates in the corporate business? Uh, I know sometimes small roofers don't quite have those yet. We've been on job news for five years, um, and uh, we love them. So job news is kind of the core of the information movement and task management movement. Um, of the initial part of the tech stack that you would interact with as a salesperson is sales rabbit. Um, tracks our canvassing efforts, tracks our leads. It's how we disperse and hand, hand out our leads. As they come in through various sources, they all go out through sales rabbit assigned to the reps by their territories, et cetera, et cetera. Um, company cam is utilized immediately after that as they start to be taking inspection photos. Those are synced with job notice, those go right into the file. Job notice is used um, when we get to the point of presentation or um, the build contract signing. Um, we're going to use Sumo Quote as our presentation tool. I would say that Sumo Quote and Company Cam are probably the strongest value per <coughs> of the parts of the tech stack that are easily uh, implementable by you know small and medium sized companies. I would say those are two super really strong ones. Thank you. Well, I want to speak to the people who might not have a CRM yet. There's a little trick I did when I was starting. Uh, you have software companies popping up all over the place right now. Uh, a lot of the reason is just so you guys know that a software company, when they're selling, like a, a roofing company probably gets a multiple of, you know, five, six, whatever it is, seven. Uh, but when you have software that you own, uh, you get a multiple on the revenue that comes in, not the EBITDA. On the profit, so there's a lot of a lot of tech stuff. Where I mean, we're in Silicon Slopes right now. Uh, we're in job notice. It's happening literally right around us, right? And some of these some of these new companies popping up to try to compete. They need proof of concept. They need people putting stress on their platform, testing things. And and I was one of those guinea pigs. It worked out really well. So if you guys are struggling, maybe you don't can't afford it or you know don't want to invest in it. There's other there's other ways to get some of the softwares that you want. Just look at these small pop-ups and, and you know see if you can strike a deal with them and, and advocate for them, right? Um, another thing that you can do is uh, add solar. Uh, add solar to your do that horizontal integration I was talking about. Add solar because a lot of people are stressed about the about getting money from the insurance companies. I know they've made it more complicated, but on the solar side of things, they're just like throwing money at anything that moves, right? You can fund a solar project with with a lot of loan stuff. You just have to. You have to go past all these tests. Like you look at realtors, they have to pass these tests and hang their hat somewhere. Solar people, I could go to Starbucks and, and get a barista and they could sell under twenty thousand dollar loan just like that, right? <laughs> and they're and they're giving the money out quick. So um, if if you want the funding, one of the tools you can use is, is solar. Okay, so tools. I'm more from the production side of things. They were, everybody talked about tech and, and all that stuff, but uh, one of the biggest things, because you know, time is money, right? And we got to save, we got to save time to save money. So uh, the catch-all and the uh, equipter has been a huge game changer for us, not only for our presentation when we're on the job site, but as far as efficiency of getting that job done in a timely manner. Um, and I'm going to plug Lead Scout. Lead Scout's here. It, it's something that we've implemented in our sales team for accountability. Um, it has created the opportunity where we've been able to warm up the neighborhoods. So when the lead comes in, um, we hand our sales team, you know, a list of addresses. They go out, they qualify the addresses, yay or nay. They need a roof. They don't need a roof. At that point in time, the team can go out and either put a post-it note on their door 
or it can launch a drip campaign for mailing postcards. Um, you talked a little bit about easily duplicating things, right? So we use a lot of um, uh, Loom and Teachable. So to cut our training process in half, we've created libraries uh, based upon like what we're hiring for. So for like, like our sales team, if we hire a new um, salesperson, we give them a library. Basically in that library, will show you how to enter the homeowner's information, create the quote, how to use company cam, how to use all of the other tools that we use because what happens is training somebody, before someone's trained, I mean, let, let's, let's face it, it takes three to six months before someone's fully trained, right? And a lot of that has to do to uh, poor training, environment, n no process is put in place. Once you document that entire process and you have it in your library, right? Basically, that person starts that day, you show them what their job is, and at that point in time, you show them where their library is. Before you come back to me and ask me any questions, go to your library, see if you can figure it out on your own. Because with that hands-on training like that, it cuts the training process literally in half. So we've seen a lot of progress on getting people up to speed and getting them out the door, knocking doors, or canvassing the neighborhoods, or running leads. All right, I'm gonna to go to questions in the audience here. Uh, oh, we got more than that. <laughs> um, sorry, I, I just have a question, uh, and this pertains to speaking on uh, running uh, different sizes of companies. So can you guys talk about maybe running a company zero to one million and how that organization will be structured as far as maybe your experience or how you think you would do it differently now, and then from maybe one million to 10 million and like how that organization is structured. We're gonna go a little rapid fire with these because we only got 10 minutes, so who feels like they got the most to say on this? I didn't hear that. I scared people off. Repeat the question. How to operate a business. And then what it changes like when you get bigger. Just the, what the company structure is. And then the one to 10, yeah. Um, I would say the zero to one million, you need one office person and one really good salesperson. I would. I always recommend that to be the owner. I think the owner should stay on the sales side until he can hire all the things behind him because that's the revenue generating side of everything. Keeps the gas bill, keeps the company growing fast, keeps lively. Oftentimes the owners get buried in all of the stuff that they really don't like doing. Um, and then they buy the process and they get that experience. I think owners should stay on the sales side, hire behind them and keep running, you know, moving forward as the, the pioneer, the frontier men, I guess, in that sense. Um, once you get to probably, you know, two million plus, you're gonna need an office person and a production person. Once you add on your first couple salespeople, you're gonna need a relationship with salespeople and production people. Uh, once you get to like three to five million, you're gonna need an extra support in the office. You're probably gonna need a separate finance seat. So five million, you're gonna be like five to eight people inside the office, I would imagine. Um, and then once you start- The lean, he likes to run companies lean, right? You're yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely, because you gotta have cash to grow. So if you're gonna maintain that growth rate, you gotta be stacking cash can't be wasting it. And at that, at that point, there's a high burn rate of energy. There are long work hours. You're demanding a lot. You're building a strong culture. You're getting people very committed. People that aren't, they run, they leave the company quickly. Um, but if that's your journey, then you gotta stay on it. Um, once you start getting about five million, it's gonna get a little more complex. You're gonna start to have like, you know, more than just one person at the top. You're gonna have a leader of management in there, probably over somebody over finance, somebody over production, somebody over sales, and then that owner is gonna probably pick a seat in there somewhere. I would say still stay in sales, that's my, Thing until you get to a certain size where you can actually function as a CEO, which is probably 10 to 20 million range. So I like that speed. <laughs> That's good. Um, we go here. So if you guys are starting up tomorrow, your own roofing company, um, not existing to anything today, what's the one nugget that you're going to do? What's the first move that you make if you're starting a company tomorrow? Who wants it? I'll answer, but I'm going to have to All right, isn't that right? Yeah, good stuff. Oh, man, some people need this answer. I say stay as the one-man show as long as you can. It's the highest profit. It's the most profitable seat in the industry. If you stay as a one-man show and you can sell $2 million a year, which I guarantee you every one of you could if you really wanted to, sell $2 million a year, have one person, production person, one office person, and don't do anything else until you stack enough cash to decide what you want to do in life. And if you want to grow, then take your $2 million you have banked and invest it in yourself and build a real business on it. That's what I would say, that's how I would do it. I'd be happier, I'd probably be better. Um, I might not have a company quite as big as I have now, but I guarantee you I'd have more cash than I am. Anyone else want to go at that? I'm gonna second that one. 
<laughs> but I think we all we have people in our friend group who we trust, and, and some people are not business owners. So maybe talk to the friend who you know will give you the honest answer. This is what I'm thinking about doing, you know, am I crazy? What do you see as my weakness? Because sometimes our friends are the best to point out, like, you know, well, you're actually having these weaknesses already, you didn't have a business. And so they might tell you, get your family in order and then start that journey, you know. So maybe go to a confidant, go to a friend, and just get their input on, is this even a good path for me? Yeah, the, if you're gonna start tomorrow, it's like, it's learning and doing, right? You, you want to invest in, um, yourself and learning all the skill sets you possibly can. So buy as much knowledge as you can to avoid paying a lot of dumb tax, right? And, uh, but then listen, right? Because I see a lot of people asking the same fucking questions in the Facebook groups every fucking year. And it's the same shit at every conference and they're at every conference and they haven't grown their business an inch. So learn and then don't doubt the advice of those smarter than you and go fucking do it. Boom. Uh, what else we got? Okay, here we go. Thank you. Best advice for recruiting sales. Ooh, I love this. Oh, one. Good. I love this. One. I love hiring fairs. Um, I think that it's really fun to post to blast the market with an ad that says like make a hundred thousand dollars a year, right? And then have like a, a, a hiring fair date that you're gonna have a big thing at your office or go rent a WeWork or if you're here, ask Job Nimbus to use it, like something, like look bigger than you are. Um, make sure you have someone who's responsible for phoning, emailing, texting, updating them, getting them excited. Like they gotta know that this is a fucking event, right? When they show up, balloons, like balloons, donuts, have a TV, get a presentation made. Somebody make you a presentation about your company, about your sales process, about your how your unique differentiators are to the market. Make it seem like they would be stupid to sell a roost for any other company than you because of what makes you unique in your business. Have everybody sit in the room, do your 15 minute presentation, and then take one, two leaders, and fire everybody off for five, 10 minute interviews. Call every single one of them back, whether they, you hire them or not, and then you start them at the same time and they become the class of quarter one, 2023, and they rise together and they join and celebrate together. And then they remember what it was like to be in the class of, and like it creates this really good company culture. I really love that approach. Who in here has heard of SRU? Anybody? Sales Recruiting University? I think that's one of the great avenues out there as far as getting your name out there a lot. What they can do for you is they essentially do a two week, or two times a week a Zoom interview where you jump on there, typically they'll get 20 to 30 candidates on the Zoom interview. You can quickly jump on there, explain what the position entails um, so everyone gets to see it clearly as far as you know what you expect, what the compensation is, what they need to do. Anybody here heard of Spark SparkHire? Spark Hire, anybody? That is a, a one-way interview uh, company. I think there's a couple of other ones out there. So after that interview is complete, you can put a link to the Spark Hire in, in, in the, uh, the Zoom uh, uh, interview. And then uh, they essentially complete three questions that you ask them as far as a one-way interview. And then at that point, by the time they get to the end of that, you have some pretty highly qualified people that are interested in candidates to where typically we would get anywhere from you know 10 to 15 candidates that would go through the Zoom interview, all the way through the Spark Hire, and then from them you review the Spark Hires, uh, such as one-way interviews, to be able to either bring them in for an in-person interview or however you want to proceed with those. I feel like there's gotta be a little bit more folks that want to talk on this one. Uh, so the past two weeks, I think I've recruited 86 sales orgs to one single company. Um, I left yesterday to go talk to another one because they wanted to do the same. I recruited like crazy. I did it when I was working at Viv and, and now I do it on a national level. The number one thing that I look for in a company and the number one thing that I teach uh, is to have your operations in place. That is the biggest step that everyone skips and I don't understand. You can recruit all you want and, and, and you can bring them into your organization but they will leave just as fast as they came in if you don't have the proper pay scales to complement your operations, to complement your uh, overhead, your risks, all of that stuff, you have to have the contract set. You need so many if and then statements. I put some up there uh, the other day, because, or yesterday, because when someone is coming to look to work with you, they're leaving a situation uh, that they don't like, right? But they're gonna come and sit in front of you and say, well, but do you do this? Do you do this? Do you do this? And you need to remind them, hey, I know your other companies who work with did that stuff. We don't do it. Uh, there's a reason you're sitting here right now. You wanted something different, you wanted something unique, right? 
this is it. This is different than everything that you've seen before. But you need to show them something, right? And you need to show them the protections that they have that they didn't get at the other companies. For example, what happens if there's a lead generator that goes out and gets it, and then there's a closer that closes it, if you guys do the setter and closer model, but then another setter said, well, hey, that was mine. I generated that. They just happened to knock on the door. That was my account. What do you do then? Are those safety pr uh, protections set in place? Like all of those if and then statements. Those need to be built. Recruiting brochures need to be built. Salespeople are emotional people. A lot of you guys are technical. You get on the roofs, you, you do the work, you, here's the numbers, here's the, here's the time you get here. You're a structured individual. Salespeople are emotional, right? And they have to be because that's how they empathize with the homeowner. And so they want all of the, they want all of the, the stuff shown that they're taking care of. They want all of the sales tools. They want the pretty pictures and the graphics and the culture. They want that stuff. So build all of that stuff first. I swear to you, if you guys build that and you build it really well, salespeople will actually just be walking through your door because you have the structure for them to operate within. I think uh, we might have a moment for one more. Does anyone else have one? <coughs> Otherwise, we can, uh, Jen would like to say something and then we're gonna take a break. So thank you guys. Actually, actually sorry, one second. I wanna give the, all these guys a shot to just say what they do and what their company does well one more time, if you guys don't mind, because I really, really appreciate you guys spending the time to be here. I want to give them an opportunity to. Yeah, just what we do really well. Yeah, basically, I want you to talk about behind the tool belt. What, what, do you, what would you like to promote? I want to give you a, a 30 seconds to promote or a minute to promote what you want. Oh, okay. Yes, yeah, so I am the co host at Behind the Tool Belt, and we go live every single Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for the past three years. So check it out. Ooh. Subscribe to our YouTube page. I think we have like 88 subscribers. So before you guys leave here, Jen, lock the door. <laughs> Nobody can leave here Double until you class. subscribe to the Uncle Bell YouTube. Do it now. Get your friends out. Yeah. We're, done. We're waiting for a second. Yeah, the tool belt on YouTube. Yeah. All right, so I, I guess if I'm to pick one, I'd say SolarCon. Uh, please go there. You guys will love it. We have panels. We have people speaking on how to build um, the installation portion of it. A lot of roofing companies, they don't really care about the sales side. They care about how to build the operational side. So this year, we have sectioned off an entire half of the conference to appeal to people that want to start integrating solar into their business. Uh, whether they're sales orgs on the solar side that want to learn how to do installations or roofing companies that want to do installations. Uh, we have started to build out a solar con. You can learn all of the language. You can hear all of the people, see all of the software, see all the products. It's just an educational conference. Uh, nobody is allowed to pitch uh, on, the, on the stage. So come to SolarCon. The website is attendsolarcon.com. Also, I've got two quick things. Uh, I'm speaking here in a little bit. I don't know if I'm next or next after next, but um, we'll be talking about generating the highest quality, lowest cost leads in your market. Um, one of the ways that we do that, there's a multifaceted approach, but one of the ways we do it is through door-to-door -door canvassing. And uh, I, I have a program that we partnered with, Sales Transformation Group, that trains your people and your reps and your company and your sales leaders on door-to-door -door approaches, even if you're retail. It teaches you how to add door-to-door -to, -door to follow up on your retail leads to get more out of each one of those. It's called Roof Warrior. I have a product I invented from my roofing company while I was in that called the Catch-All. It's a really cool deal. You should check it out. You should buy one. company and we're selling it today in Pittsburgh. Um, so we're really good at the retail sales model on both roof replacements and review. And so when you do business with us, we give you a proven model, we'll teach you how to do it, and uh, maybe you'll be able to work with me, which will be fun. Um, I, the, the challenge in business is sometimes you know, to really know your customer, your ideal customer avatar. The other problem is making sure your ideal customer avatar knows that you exist. So I think I really have to help you guys self-identify with if you're the right fit for us to be able to be helpful. So I kind of 
have identified our best customer as the kind of roofing company owner where the marginal utility of more money in your bank account is having a diminishing rate of return on your happiness. That is kind of defined as like a roofer who's doing $7 million or more, has been doing 10% profit for two years or longer, and they don't really benefit from another car, another vacation, buying their wife another bag. They just wish that their business could run the way they always knew it could or should, and they just can't find a way to do that. And our consulting company helps do that. And if you're that company, I will probably outrank your son as a baby kid. <laughs> <laughs> Roof Cold Pro, that's what we design here at Roof Cold. Uh, it's uh, the instant estimator that you can install on your website. What you put on your website keeps the traffic going. Right. On your website, what a lot of cool things are doing with contractors is the QR codes to where the uh, big mailers or go to the notes to where the um, customer can scan the QR code and instantly brings up their house to where they can get an instant estimate on their property. The ultimate uh, lead, uh, lead uh, conversion tool uh, that you can have on your website. All right, everyone, give them a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks for joining.